Welcome to the channel. It's day number two of the gear swap. This will be part three. Part one, part one was the unboxing. Part two was the, um, the removal of everything. So everything's been removed, broken down. And today is part three where we're gonna do the installation of all the new things, all the new gears, all the new hardware. So fingers crossed that we don't that we don't run into uh, more Smitty problems. Sit tight, enjoy. Grab it's gonna be <laughs> grab a beer, grab a coffee. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grab a coffee right now, and uh, enjoy. It's gonna be long, but it's gonna be informative. And again, I haven't seen anything on YouTube of anyone doing a gear swap on these new 4 Gen Rams. A full blown video of the whole entire thing so make sure you check that out that information will be in the description below all the information for Chester County transmissions will be in the description below um, from what I'm hearing people are already booking their uh, gear swaps so that's awesome it's great those guys can handle it and this is their first fourth gen too so they're learning as well so they'll be able to do yours more efficiently and effectively in the future because they'll know what to expect with this American axle manufacturing America yep it's not the Dana. It's completely different from the Dana from the older Rams. So we're learning. And I also learned one thing. I never want to do this by myself. Holy hell. I don't know how guys would even attempt to do this in their driveway. <laughs> uh, I, was... I saw your truck, there'd be no way. <laughs> <laughs> if you're following my Instagram story, you should see some of the pictures. But all right, guys, we'll see you at Chester County Transmissions. <laughs> All right, boys, want to give me a recap of yesterday? Yeah, so yesterday, there was tons of fun. You guys saw it. We'll see it. All we had all the hurdles we dealt with. So we kind of know what we're getting into today as far as what we're doing with our seals, how we're going to manage uh, the, the front differential, the rear differential. The front differential, which is usually the easier of the two, ended up giving us the biggest curveballs. But again, it kind of all comes with the territory. So we have, let me go grab these real quick. These um, right here. We're going to use these two guys. These are, are, are going to be our setup bearings. So we're going to spend the morning kind of honing these out. We'll use these to uh, make sure we get everything dialed in just right. Uh, so yeah, you know, yesterday was tear down, both front and rear differentials, and today is going to be build. Are you excited? Ecstatic. And I'm off to Target. Nope, she, she's helping. <laughs> she's going to, she's working today. She's ram beasting. Wrong. It's like a... You know, what is this? Uh, some sort of alien spaceship or something, right? <laughs> We've seen this in a movie. I know it. Alien? <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But this is a cylinder hone. Um, it isn't necessarily what you typically use for this, but um, we have this one, and we have this one, which is small, and these little stones are pretty well hammered. I'm just going to work with what I have, and I'll make this work. What's going to be most important is that you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna work on one spot. You know, as I hone it, you know, I'm gonna make sure we kind of go in and out and in and out. And the other thing is, I gotta get some cutting lube. All you uh, machinist guys out there are probably rolling over in your graves, but just gotta get it done. Adapt and overcome. That's right. <laughs> Getting the pinion head bearing off of this pinion. Put the shell around the bearing. Contains the shell. And apply force. There's a reason we're taking this bearing off to get at this shim so we can measure it. Removing the ring gear. We'll do the large gear first.
the old ring. This carry, smaller butt, there's nothing on this head of this bolt telling you which way it turns, so you assume it's a right hand thread. If it has an L on it, it means it's a left hand thread. And it comes out going righty. Empty carrier. Just waiting on the new ring. How's the honing coming? Oh, it's it's a tedious process. It's not. <laughs> it's just a little bit at a time. A little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. Clean and dry. They went on that far. <laughs> you can buy, and again, you can buy them pre-made, but you have to know exactly which bearing you're going to be getting, you know. And sometimes you can't get them. There's definitely more aggressive techniques than that that honing stone there, but the idea is, you know, we don't want it to be overly sloppy. You know, you you want it to be a nice, snug fit as it slides down over the pinion because. During the setup stage, it's important that the orientation of the pinion to the ring gear is predictable. Um, so if you would just get real crazy and just start hogging this thing out and you just go to slide it over and it goes. That's new. Yeah. That's no bueno. That's, That's no bueno. Good. Yeah, yeah, no bueno at all. We have our uh, hose out setup bearing. So basically, what you want to see is it to go on and just kind of work its way down. It's a snug fit and you want it to be a snug fit. That's kind of the idea. You know, again, we don't want it loosey goosey. <clears throat> Typically these get pressed on and pressed off. So and again, we want it to be snug, but the idea is to not have to um, press it off each time. What happened? I Did it know. grow? I mean, Did it grow? Seriously. Did it, it just... grow? I mean, I mean it's gonna go off, but that's not kind of not the not the point. Yeah, it slid right on before. Now. Well, it's on there now. Yeah, well now I'm gonna have to take it to the yeah. press and now get it back off, it. but. It won't, I mean, I don't expect it to be hard. I mean, the reality is even if that I could even move it that far with just a little dead blow, it's, it's clearly uh, barely an interference fit, so. And that's what they call that, by the way, when, whenever you're pressing um, a bearing or any sort of metal object onto another metal object and there's no other mechanical um, means of adhesion other than the two uh, surfaces that's called an interference fit so so when we press these on if you've ever wondered why well the inner race doesn't turn and the outer one you know these are able to and the inner one doesn't turn on that it's because of again the interference fit so and that's what we're trying to get rid of by honing it out and again the fact that I was able to even hammer it on that far uh, indicates that we got rid of a good bit of it but we're not quite there, I suppose. I don't know how. I, I could just know. slide it right on and then, Dude, it just then a second later and not go, but. but it uh, literally yeah. just slid right on. And yeah. we're like, all right, we gotta do this on the video. Take that back off. And he slid it off with his hands and, well, there you have it. Good times. We're gonna cook the ring. Yep, is that what we're gonna do? Basically, yeah, we're, gonna, we're basically gonna cook the ring. We don't want our pancakes tasting like a uh, rape clean. Although I can't tell you the last time we had pancakes <laughs> here at the shop. It's a multi-purpose grill you got going on there. And we're gonna put this in the freezer.
about 10 minutes, everything should be hunky-dory. Andy, what's one thing to note when you're cleaning this? <laughs> that when you tip it over, the torsen setup likes to just come apart. It just kind of just kind of falls out. Um, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. This particular setup is pretty, uh, pretty easy to come apart. And then when they do come apart, they don't always go back together the easiest because you're dealing with gear meshing. You know, this big guy has to mesh with all these little guys, all these little planets, and uh, yeah, it just can be kind of kind of pain in the butt sometimes. So I guess it is worth keeping in mind. It smells good in here. What are we cooking? <laughs> We're cooking ring gear. <laughs> and we've got the uh, frozen carrier. And that does it. Just to make note, we're using the, the old bolts. Because yes. the kit came with new ones, we're just using the old ones. To get to it started. Neat trick? Yes. We'll be using that again shortly. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> locker on the bolts we're actually going to use and set the torque. Something to keep in mind, the manufacturer was kind enough to put the L on there. The replacements don't have an L. Hopefully I don't have to take them apart again, but if I do, you guys are going to be doing it. That's great. <laughs> Expensive. Refer to it as Excalibur. We're good to go. We are torqued. We got the ring gear hot off the hot plate in the carrier from the freezer. Tidy lefty Lucy's. Yeah. Thread lock these. Seventy five foot pounds. Mm. 
and we are pressing the carrier bearings onto the carrier. <coughs> Manufactured as a set, it probably wouldn't be minimal harm to exchange the races, but it's just good practice to keep the race that was with that bearing. Does live flush. Yep. All right. That's one done. So, just as all the fun um, would be fun, luckily, you know, we, if you guys remember, we unloaded the front carrier um, in an attempt to remove the differential assembly without having to disturb the axle seal on the passenger side. So we unloaded it. So, you know, we're getting ready to take these differentials back into the other building, get them installed. Um, so I was talking with Pete about reloading the carrier and it'd be easier to do obviously before we put it up in the vehicle. So we got to look at things and this is what we this is what we came across. This is where the differential pin um, gets installed. If, as you can see if you look across the uh, the top of the gear tooth there's not really going to be any easy way to get that pin in and you know some differentials are like that where in order to remove the pin the ring actually has to come off. Um, so we're gonna have to take a few steps backward to take all the rest forward So we're gonna take this rain gear back off so we can uh, load this carrier and get the pin in Life lessons <laughs> So we're warming up our front ring gear uh, so we can reinstall it. They are they are definitely a snug fit on the carriers That's for sure. It's not too often that we actually have to um, Hot plate a ring gear to get it to easily go on while that's warming up. We're gonna go ahead and install our Pinion races. So we have two races here. They go. We have the larger one, which is our pinion head. That's going to get installed right here. And then tail side. You know, we're going to go ahead and drive this puppy in there. Um, so it's just case prep. This is just case prep. This way, um, as soon as we get the differential over here and the pinion, we can you know start putting it together. So here we go. So this is this set here is designed specifically for driving uh, races into cases. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different techniques for driving in at bearing races. You know, um, an old school method is just to use a long extension or um, long drift and you just kind of work your way and evenly drive it in. That's the most important thing when you're driving a race, and it has to go in even. You can't put it in cockeyed. You know, this has to go in straight. You can't, you know. None of this kind of lumpy stuff. So when you have a big driver like this, you know, we're going to get good, even force in one direction at, you know, all points. So if it does make it easier, but, you know, everybody has their own, their own mode. That's the, That's the finished noise. It's just a, it's a unique sound when, uh, when a bearing race is, hits bottom, you know, has a very blunt, dead sound. And that's what you look for. I mean, still you want to inspect it and make sure everything's good and flat. Uh, you know, kind of like we talked about a little bit ago, but it's, it has its own noise. Once you've done enough of them, you just, you can hear it a mile away. That's the install sound. 
On to the rear rear. Rear rear. <laughs> rear rear. <laughs> You recognize that noise? Yep. Boom. All right. Putting a little lube on the pinion bearing before we put it into setup. We want there to be some lubrication on the rollers of this head bearing. Do the same for the bearing behind the nut. So when it's sitting in there, we get proper feel so we can get a proper pattern. Do it for both of them. We don't want to run them dry. Yeah, we don't want to run them dry. That's for sure. Yeah. Get the rest of it. Right. Yeah. Dry run. So, yep, note we're not doing anything with the seal. Uh, this is just the first step in getting an idea of what our pattern is going to look like. So, no seals yet. Seals is for final assembly. So the idea is just to tighten it up so there's no, no play between the pinion bearings. So the, both the bearings are seated in their races. So essentially where this, where this pinion is right now is where it'll live during the uh, final assembly. Because again, so what is most crucial is the relationship between the pinion gear and the ring gear. This location, the idea is we want to get it to where it's going to be for final assembly. So we can now introduce the ring gear to the pinion and then set up our backlash and uh, hopefully get a good pattern. In this instance, this is the exact shim that came out of the original setup. Um, we're hoping that thickness will work. There's a chance and we're hoping. Okay. Still warm. Now that the differential, the carrier, the ring gear is um, inside the housing, there are adjusters, spanners is what we call them, uh, that are used to move the carrier assembly left to right. And that's how we establish what the backlash is. The backlash is a specification, every you know, differential has its own. Um, so right now he's just simply trying to engage carrier bearings with the spanner um, to I stabilize the rear. Then what we'll do is we'll take the ring gear, we're gonna move it up against, all the way up against the pinion to where we have zero backlash. So no, you'll see us do it when you try to rock, we try to rock the ring gear. Um, so we get to the zero, and then we'll begin to move it away from the pinion. So looking at it, we'll be moving it to the left to get our backlash adjustment, and then we'll cincher down from there and run a pattern. So yeah, if you guys can hear, so now that, that's a little, little rocking, that's, that's essentially backlash. That's the amount of play between the ring gear and the pinion gear. So we wanna 
push it this way to get to our zero point, which we were just at, but we're gonna go back there. We backed off just to make sure we were where we thought we were. So again, I mean, in this step here, the, the, these carrier cap bolts can't be tight because the spanner in there won't be able to rotate. You can't have it so loose that the um, differential assembly, the carrier assembly, isn't properly seated in its uh, cradle, if you will. So it's a little bit of a fine line. Now we're at a point here where it won't even move, which means now we're certainly at zero, but a little bit too far because the ring gear is pinched against the pinion. So we're not getting any motion, any you know, spin. So we'll go, we'll go back that way just a little bit to get back to our zero point. These are our races, carry races. They're essentially living right here in, in the differential assembly. So what we're trying to do is we want to make sure as we move it that this race stays fully seated on the bearing. Um, we don't want it to be loose like this. So we need the whole assembly to move and stay seated in the outer race. A little tricky, but it's not that hard. You gotta be conscious of what you're doing. Seems like zero to me. Yeah. You can kind of get a feel for what you know what six thousands is backlash so and that's the backlash for this six to ten six to ten is the spec for this again you guys might as well see we're using our, our handy dandy installation instructions don't leave home without them so yeah our spec for our, we're nine and a quarter right so backlash up here at the top bl and thousandths of an inch so we are at six to ten thousandths so that's what we're going to go for and these are the rest of our specs so we don't have to keep them back here we'll at least show you guys now pinion bearing preload right here right so new bearings because obviously you could be doing this other work with old bearings we're going to be at 14 to 19 inch pounds that's bearing preload that's a rotational torque we'll use the uh the, the torque meter which is right here this is our torque o meter Right there, that handy dandy tool. And um, then we also have, uh, you know, we already went over our ring gear and cap torques a little bit earlier, so 65 and 75 respectively. But again, this is a, you know, you can't build a rear without this information. You just figure the bigger, the, the, the more backlash there is, the, you know, you have the ability to achieve more momentum and it's gonna, it's gonna make a louder knock. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think that's it. I think you're there. Yeah. We're trying to rock this, right? Obviously our pinion is back in there. You can kind of see it if you look at the top. Um, and so the, there's a pinion flange on the other side and we can turn it this way too. But when it gets really a tight backlash, you, you really have to hold the pinion flange to really stabilize it because it's just very, very difficult to, to measure otherwise because it's, everything wants to just move. You know, you grab it and you know, it just, it all goes, so. All right. Dial indicator time. So the reality is, guys, if you ever go to a shop and you want to have them build you a rear, there's a certain, there's just a few tools that you better ask them. Don't ask them if they have these tools specifically. Just ask them to list the tools that they're going to use to build your differential. If they're not saying things like dial indicator, torquometer, you're probably at the wrong place. We're going to do our measurements from three spots, Pete. Yeah. to there. Yeah. Let's do one more. It went away. Yep. So it was a little too loose. Yeah, that's why you do it. Yep. That's why you check that. There was enough play in the caps to give me a false reading. But you can't move these spanners with them snug.
It was a lot of back and forth, but we finally got it to eight, right, Pete? Eight is where we want to be, right? Between six and ten. Nice. One more spot. Yep. So the marks that you put on the ring, is that just where you're... Three different spots. We, we got the eight the first time on that location, that location, and that location. Paint to put on the gears. <laughs> Pinion depth measured and our pattern, the gear tooth interface pattern, and make any corrections if we have to. Lady of Blessed Acceleration. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're doing this, you want to make sure you have some drag on the pinion to simulate road load. Um, it just helps get the most accurate pattern. And we're going to look, there's two profiles to the tooth, the drive side and the coast side. Um, the drive side is the most important. Um, not that the coast isn't, but we're going to be more critical of the drive side. So drive side, yes, coast side, and by George. Looking Could good. we get any better than that? I mean, that is just that's completely on the money. So, uh, just to go over again some of the, the the crucial aspects of of a tooth pattern. So, if we we'll start on the coast side here. So, if you look up on the coast side, you'll see that there's that sharp line about seven eighths of the way down the tooth. Um, that line you don't want to see that line driven all the way down into the valley here okay so that means we're, we're, we're way too tight pinions too too deep in the case um, so we don't want to see it all the way down with that said you also don't want to see your pattern which again the, the pattern is the the uh, shadowy area okay we don't want to see that pattern running off the top of the tooth either that would indicate they were too far away so uh, what's most important is how either how far down or how far up or towards the top of the tooth we are. Realistically, out to this outer edge or this inner edge is not actually the most crucial part. Um, this just so happens that we are pretty dead center. Um, and you know, if you look at all three of these examples, uh, they're consistent, which is important too, because um, we're looking for things, making sure that uh, this axis is, is um, proper. So the, the, the carrier's not in here, cattywampus this way, and also that the ring gear is attached evenly to the carrier. And when you have situations like that, you'll see that because you'll have unusual patterns tooth to tooth because things are running um, less than uh, kind of perpendicular to this drive axis. Um, so coast side looks fantastic, and we will go down to our drive side, and we're seeing a lot of the same stuff. We, we have, you see a sharp line there towards the bottom, but not all the way at the bottom. The majority of the shadowy area is in the middle of the tooth. And again, when I say middle, I'm stressing um, top, you know, valley to top, not heel to toe. Um, so that's a great pattern. I mean, we hit it right on the money, guys. I mean, this is, uh, that's fantastic. We actually did a Hail Mary before uh, we did this. We, we, did, we did a Hail, a Hail Mary, uh, an Our Father, you know, there's a bunch of Catholics in the room right now, so, I mean, we had rosaries the whole bit, and uh, I'm sure that's why it's right. It has nothing to do with anything we did. It was definitely the, our fathers yeah. and Hail Marys. He's looking down on us. That's right. <laughs> At this point, we have a good pattern. Um, what we haven't done up to this point is put in a crush collar, uh, and we haven't put in our seal. So that's all final assembly stuff. And when we put in our crush collar, that's when we're gonna work on our uh, pinion bearing preload and that's our rotational torque and all that jazz. So that's what we're gonna get to next. In order to do that though, all this has to come out. Um, there's an axle seal here that we're gonna replace. So this spanner has to come out. And to give ourselves a best chance of not having to do a whole lot of um, moving this in order to achieve our backlash again, we're going to attempt to leave this spanner where it's at and hopefully it doesn't move too much. So when we go ahead and put our carrier assembly back in, that's gonna be our 
starting point and we're just going to tighten up to that and hopefully we get right back to the same backlash. And again, there is a range for backlash. Backlash doesn't have a huge impact on the pattern. It has almost no impact and it's important for you guys to understand that if you have a bad pattern, you can only change it by moving the pinion. You either move it, make it deeper in the case or shallower in the case. Backlash is not used to adjust a pattern. It's just a common misunderstanding. You'd think that, okay, this pattern is a result of how the teeth, teeth mesh pinion to ring, which is true, but as far as the, the, the nature of the pattern, um, it's all coming from the pinion. The backlash is simply uh, the amount of play, so we don't have premature wear of the gears. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. Don't ever try to adjust your pattern by using backlash. All right, let's get it apart. We're gonna do our final assembly. Uh, we're gonna install the pinion seal, and then we're going to put the pinion back in, but this time with the crush collar. So here is our pinion. This here is the crush collar. Um, so what it does is it pushes up against this outer bearing um, to help maintain uh, a, a tension between these two bearings. And that's about it. It also helps keep the nut from back off, backing off. Um, it's important to get it right though. If you tighten this too much, so as we begin to tighten it, it's going to smash down. You can see how it has a little bit of a pre burble in it, pre bend in it. It's, well, you're gonna see it's very, very difficult to smash this. Um, by hand, we usually would pre-smash it, so we would mash it up with the old one, you know, from, so if, say we're building a rear, we're just putting in bearings. We would take the old crush collar, size it up, mic it in a few different places, go to the, the press, start smashing it, get a pre-smash. Um, you can't go to the same size because, again, we are looking for some spring tension, but we can at least get it down to where we're within a couple thousands, and we're not having to completely smash this thing. I say completely, it's not gonna go flat like a pancake. Once the pinion's in, we'll be able to put our, our differential carrier assembly in. Basically seal it up. We'll deal with the four-wheel drive issue too and one more, um, one more axle seal there on the, drive, on, our, on the passenger side. Which maybe you'll get the pleasure of seeing that. That's going to be good times too. But on to pinion install. Again, this is our spanner that, that we've been turning with a, just simply a small punch. But if you look further inside, you'll see there's a brand new seal that we installed. This is the axle seal. Again, it's a unique thing to Chrysler where they use these inboard axle seals. So again, we have the one here that we kind of talked about early on during disassembly, and we have the one over here. And this one here has already been replaced. Uh, just, just FYI. Again, we're here. It makes sense to do it now. Uh, because as you see, in order to do it, all of this has to be out of the way. That would be the installation of the pinion seal. One thing, guys, to, that's, that's worth knowing about seals, and this is a little bit of maybe a life lesson too, um, the seal area here, this is called a lip seal, um, you always want to make sure that's lubricated. All right, no, we don't want any dry rides, guys. So we're going to make sure there's a little bit of lube on there when we put the, put the pinion in and put the flange on and all that. No dry rides. No dry rides. <laughs> what do you think, Pete? Need some lube. <laughs> we don't want any dry rides. <laughs> this is the flange, the pinion flange for the front differential. Um, what's, what's interesting here is that, that um, Dodge Chrysler's going out of their way to make sure we keep every bit of dust and stuff out of there. So every lip seal, every seal in general, has two parts to it. Um, there's the sealing ring, the sealing portion, and then there, it inherently has its own dust shield. I because in order for the seal to have any sort of longevity, you have to keep things away from the sealing surface. Any sand, dirt, debris gets in there, it's just gonna chew up the seal edge and it won't seal anymore. Um, so every seal has it, but Dodge is going out of the way. We have an additional dust ring here. Okay, so we have this here. We also have this solid metal protector to keep debris and whatnot away from it. And then also this is what you typically see this extra ring, the shiny portion on the outside. This is actually installed over top of the um, the forged flange. And usually when you see this, you would call this a, a seal saver, essentially, because what happens is when seals wear it over time, they create a groove. Sometimes that groove is so bad that you can't just simply install a new, new seal and because you need a new sealing surface. So by having this here, this can be removed over time and the new one put on. You don't have to actually replace the whole flange, so it's a pretty neat... It's just awesome that they went through this much trouble. You don't see that with uh, most applications. So just some FYI. Best thing we said about Ram this whole video. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that actually makes it any better, but yeah, this works. All right.
one thing I'm going to point out, guys, I'm going to get a little closer to this. This is the pinion nut. This. Okay. There we go. So if you look, you can see that this is not a perfect circle. It kind of has portions of it that are flattened here in the here in the center here. You can see them, maybe. Kind of got some focus going there. Um, in either case, this is a self-locking nut. Uh, it doesn't require any sort of Loctite, but we are going to use Loctite because, after all, we have it. And why, why not, right? We're just going to play it extra safe, use some Loctite. Just so one of you guys to be aware. And you see there's no flange on the bottom, so there's good, this one's going to require a washer. If you ever see a nut without a flange, it almost has, it has to have a washer. Uh, just keep that in mind, too. Rotational torque basically is the resistance to turning, the resistance to this motion here. So um, the, the, the tighter that nut is, uh, the more it's going to resist this, which is the, the load on the bearing. And again, if this load's too high, it'll burn the bearings out prematurely. If it's, if it's too loose, same thing. We'll have, uh, you know, bearing failure and or issues with our pattern and backlash then because the pinion's loose, essentially. Um, you know, there's, this is probably a good time to kind of segue into replacing pinion seals. Um, you know, and it's Randy's ring opinion, opinion that, opinion that a pinion seal generally doesn't go bad on its own. It's usually the byproduct of some sort of um, play that develops with heat. So as things warm up, they expand and you can develop play where you don't have play now. So when we talk about play, we talk about being able to move this pinion flange up and down. So if there was plays in, play in the bearings here, this would go and have motion to it. And it doesn't right now because obviously everything's together the way it's supposed to be. But um, when you go to replace that pinion seal, you're going to have to take this flange off, which means you're going to have to loosen that nut. So all these steps that we're going through right now, you can imagine it get be, gets to be problematic. When you put that nut back on, if you over torque it, you're going to burn up the bearings. If you under torque it, all the problems that we kind of already talked about. So it's just, I just want to give some insight into some pinion seal replacement and some of the caveats of doing that. I'm not going to get into how you actually go about it. That'll be next week's episode. <laughs> 10. 14 to 19. So we have 10 inch pounds of rotational um, torque or resistance. Resistance to rotation. Um, so this is where it gets kind of a little bit tricky because every degree of turn can be a little bit exponential and usually what, the way this usually goes is you try and you get no change you try and you get no change you try and get no change and then you get overzealous because you're not getting any change and you give it the beans and then you got too much and then just drop your tools and go home went from nine to ten <laughs> You may learn a technique that can be employed if you think you've gone too far. You know, it's just, it, it, again, once it starts, once you start making changes, differences in that torque, it happens quick. And that's why you have to, you have to keep going little bits at a time. It just is very different from the last time. Wow. Yep. Normal technique, really. How much, what is it? 28. 28. Just like that. Just like that. Yeah. The, the, the idea of hitting it is to, again, there, there's concern that the, how seated are the bearings. Um, so by kind of wrapping on it from a few different angles, you just make sure that things are situated, basically. You know, it's, it's a slightly an, an inexact science, but you want to at least make sure things are where they belong. Eighteen. Nineteen. Good to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good opportunity to see, get an idea of what exactly this spanner is trying to do. You can see how this uh, outer race is not fully seated on the cap. So as we, as this spanner gets turned out, it's going to push this further on to 
the bearing itself, which again, gives us the proper alignment and that we're looking for. So if you recall from earlier, when we had this ring gear installed on the carrier, we had an issue with getting a pin in. And the reason is because this is a much, it's a taller ring gear that's profiled this way. It's taller, so it's in the way. If you remember earlier, we were able to get that pin right out. What that also means though, is if you can think of the center line of the pinion, that center line of the pinion isn't gonna change in its, as far as its relationship to this housing's concerned. With a thicker ring gear, that's pushing the whole carrier assembly further that way. By pushing the carrier assembly further that way, it's pushing the carrier bearing further that way, which means the, the orientation of the spanner relative to the center line of the housing is gonna be further that way. So here is where a little modification is gonna to have to come into play. So this right here, this is the lock for the spanner, okay? It, it goes in little holes there and uh, keeps the spanner from turning on its own. That's what, that's what one would look like in a new condition. Can you pull that one back out? You can see what we did. Because it wouldn't fit, the thickness of the, of the steel would not fit. So, can you show the, uh, what, you, what you ground off? It's not going in. This one here, so you can see we just made it overall diameter of the steel a little bit smaller, just to the grinding wheel. This way it'll fit in there and lock the spanner as it should. Just another thing you guys are gonna run into if you guys are you know, choosing to do this swap yourself. It's stage six, how nice. Time to torque. One hundred percent still on the money. See? So I mean our pattern's very much so in the center of the tooth. Um on the drive side looks good. You know, again, it's not running off the top. Like it would be, I'll go ahead and muddy it. It would smear that top edge. This top edge would be gone. Paint would be gone if it was running off the top of the tooth. And it's not, you can clearly see, you know, on this tooth here, there's a clean, very clean paint edge at the very top. Same thing here. Then we'll go to the coast side and look at the coast side. I mean, <laughs> this is the stuff of textbooks. There you have it. That's a proper, that's, I mean, that's a really good pattern. Really, really good pattern. We're good to wrap this baby up. The front, that is. Not that there's uh, not a whole lot more to do to even wrap the front up, but, but as far as the differential, the build, we got all of our torques right, our backlashes right, our rotational uh, pinion preloads right. We have, you know, um, all of our adjuster locks are in place. Our, our carrier bolts, or carrier cap bolts are torqued to spec. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, just the whole bit, the whole bit. You know, we have typically, so here's our two dots, our two dots, we use that, that's for, for right, that's the right hand cap. So we got our two dots on the right hand side. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all there. So Andy got the axle back in place on this side. Yeah, so we can install the axle seal, which has got to go inside, right there. We're gonna attempt to put the okay. axle seal in with, uh, what tool okay. number is this, special tool? Uh, I think this is special tool 38J74. Okay. All right. Just check it. Mm -hmm. All right. And then we're going to put... Okay, the ba a bearing in the nut. Right there. Towards you. Push 
it in just a little bit. And you can see what we have happening over here. But improvised in internal press. <laughs> you just gotta make it make it happen what you got. So I'm hoping we can keep a hold of that end to keep the center from turning. And I just need to get a wrench in there. Just start rent, 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 and slowly that's gonna because we're pushing up against the axle. Example of some innovation. Here's our gear axle spline, intermediate shaft spline. You can't put it in wrong. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief. <laughs> so there you go. It's in the hole. On higher mileage applications, um, a component that you'd be wanting to look into is this fork itself, but most importantly, these pads. Obviously, when you're installing this, you want to make sure that the fork goes over the collar. Otherwise, it won't work. We should do every diff build to Journey. Was it the wheel in the sky? It was. The diff in the truck <laughs> keeps on turning. We're getting delirious, guys. It is. Delirious. <laughs> One important thing to note, guys, we're always learning, right? You don't want to install this until you put the passenger side axle back in. Because you're not going to get the axle to line up. Lessons learned the hard way are always the best lessons learned. We're teaching you guys so you don't make the same uh, mistakes or and find out the same way we did. A little update. Both front axles are back in. Everything's tightened down. The 4x4 actuator is back in. Pete's reinstalling the front drive shaft. ABS lines are all tied up again, plugged back in. Wrapping up the front end. We're on the rear doing a whole lot of the same stuff we did in the front. So we're just dry, dry fitting the pinion so we can get the carrier in there so we can run our pattern and uh, see what we're working with. Assuming that the pattern's good, we will go ahead and get it back apart, get the pinion out, make sure we put on the new pinion head bearing and uh, crush collar and uh, go back together with it. Remember, it's important to make sure you take off your set out bearing and put on your new bearing. That's just an important, don't forget that. Otherwise you start all over. <laughs> don't be stingy with your paint, all right? Because you want a good, clear good pattern, okay? So I'm thinking, let's go ahead and do it again right here. I want, no, no, I want to run it. I want, I want multiple patterns at, oh, a, at a hey. opposing ends of the gear. More paint for me there? Nope. Donatello? It's all over. You cut out. You're really, you're, you're cutting me out on the paint? You cut out. I mean, you we, 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 use a, we use a third of that on the front. I did the second painting. Again, goddamn paint Nazi. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so you turn, I'll drag. We have a nice defined line that isn't buried in the gear tooth. We have the pattern, you know, you see our shady spot. We also have the, again, though, towards the, the uh, top of the tooth, we have a nice paint line. Right so, spot. right, so we're not running off the top of the tooth. Like, look right there. Look yeah. how distinct that yeah, thickness right of that paint line is, right? Yeah. And we're not driven in the bottom. So I think the drive side looks very, very nice. And it's, and it's centered. Again, you have to, uh, like I mentioned to everybody earlier, the where this pattern is, as, as far as heel to toe, it doesn't so much matter, okay? We can be up up one side, down the other. It doesn't matter as long as we're in the middle of the tooth. Um, so the contact pattern on the drive side, I think looks fantastic, really. I, you know, looking at it over and over and over, I don't see an issue with it. Now, so let's look, this is a, will be a good opportunity. But look, look at the um, coast side. So what we'll talk about on the coast side is everything that I've been talking about. When, so, for example, I want to find a good one. Let's get right in here. This is a decent one. Even these ghost teeth 
I call it a ghost tooth because we didn't actually paint this tooth, but we are seeing impressions on it, right? From paint that carried over. So we'll look at this one, we look at, we're gonna look at this one and this one. Um, here you can clearly see all of our shadowing happening right here, right? But we do have our, a nice line, right? So still, just like on the drive side, we're not driven down into the valley. So we have a nice line right there, okay? And the same thing here, we're not, we're not really coming off if, if, if there's an argument for coming off the tooth, it's very, very far out here, out here, out here at the end. So this pattern would be here. This is this pattern. So it's off the edge of the tooth, but on the coast side. But it's off the end, right? You'll tell, we're off on the end. So we're not driven down in the bottom, because we can clearly see a nice line here, right? So we're driven down. We're not just washing off the top. I mean, look, we have a nice paint line the whole way up to about right here. Every single tooth. Right here. So we can make up draw our line. We're whoop, off there. Here. We're off there. Find another one. You know, so we go, right? I mean, we, everybody can clearly see this line right here, right? So, given the depth, and you can see the depth here, when we, right, we see our line right here. So, you know, again, we're, this is where we're at. And we can look in the book and you can see that that's an acceptable pattern. Yep. So, it, is it slightly off the end of the tooth? Sure. But that's not what matters, because we're not so much, you know, front to back isn't the issue. It's, you know, valley, flank, it's fine. And, and it's on the coast side, and the right, coast side right. is less significant, but even if this was on the drive side, this would not necessarily be problematic. We did it in two separate spots because we wanted to see if there was going to be any sort of deviation in the pattern. That's a really, really nice drive side. I mean, you know, very, very clear line right here, right? And then you just, nice pattern right here. Yeah, it looks really, really good. Yeah, I mean, that's not an unacceptable. What we're seeing on the coast side is not in any way an unacceptable pattern. We can, we can look at it in the book, but we'll save that for another morning. <laughs>